Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences, Deputy Head of Mission, the Embassy of Norway, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, Vice Presidents and Executive Members of Sinaka and Europe University. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Sinaka and Europe University, I would like to welcome you to Bridges Nobel Laureate Talk, which is part of the Japan ASEAN Bridges event series facilitated by the International Peace Foundation. To commemorate the 75th anniversary of Sinaka and Europe University, we take a great pride to host the Nobel Laureate Talk on the topic of peace and economic development in the age of globalization. My name is Danai Tanami, Associate Dean at the Faculty of Economics. Please let me acknowledge our main facilitator, the International Peace Foundation. Had it not been for the International Peace Foundation, we would not have the event today. Now, I'd like to invite Mr. Uwe Moraswitz, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to give welcome remarks. Please, I'll be on the stage.
Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as one single conference, but as a series of events of now over two decades in which Nobel laureates have built bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few, but which needs the participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet, can international understanding be achieved and problems commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways, and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. It is my pleasure to invite you today to listen to and to share your views with Professor Finn Kidland, a Nobel laureate for economics, who has again agreed to come to Thailand to help us build bridges. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution towards peace. Thank you, Mr. Morales. Now, I'd like to invite Associate Professor Prince Supratet Sile, Vice President of Sinakarindiro University, to deliver opening remarks. Excellency, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, esteemed guests, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored today to welcome a distinguished speaker whose groundbreaking contribution have had a long lasting impact on the field of economics. The Nobel Prize Laureate in Economic, Professor Finn Kidlin. Professor Kidlin, a remarkable work remind as a critical issue facing our global community, such as economic inequality and the complexity of globalization. Yet, within these challenges lie opportunities for innovation, collaboration, and positive transformation. Today's topic, peace and economic development in the age of globalization is not only pertinent, but also timeless. Professor Kidland expertise provides invariable insight into the subject. It is my hope that our dialogue today will not only deepen our understanding of economic foundation, but also inspire us to take action guiding us toward a future that is more equitable and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Now, I am proud and honored to introduce our speaker today, Professor Finn Kirland. Professor Kirland was a co-recipient of 2004 Nobel Prize in Economics together with Professor Prescott for their contributions to dynamic macroeconomics. Professor Finn Kidland was born in Norway and received his BA from Norwegian School of Economics and his PhD in economics from Carnegie Mellon University in the US. He joined the faculty of the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2004. Professor Kidland was awarded the 2004 Nobel Peace 
Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences jointly with Professor Prescott. They received the Nobel Prize for their research on business cycles and macroeconomic policy. Significantly, as the driving forces behind business cycles and time consistency of economic policy. Their awarded work established the foundation for an in extensive research program on the credibility and political feasibility of economic policy. This research has largely influenced the reforms of central banks and design of monetary policy in many countries for the last decade. Research by the laureates also transformed the theory of business cycles by integrating it with the theory of economic growth. Whereas earlier research had emphasized macroeconomic shocks on the demand side. However, Professor Keatland and Professor Prescott demonstrated that the shocks on the supply side may have far-reaching effects. The methods the Professor Hitland and Professor Prescott has been widely adopted in modern macroeconomics. More recently, Professor Hitland had conducted research on the role of monetary policy for the business cycles. He has studied Ireland and Argentina in the belief that there is a lot to learn for policymakers in other countries from the respective successes and failures of these two nations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Keatland on stage. Hello everyone. <laughs> Good to see you all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to, to speak, especially seeing so many students, uh, these student looking uh, kids in, in the audience. Uh, uh, at, at my university, is, uh, uh, at uh, Santa Barbara. I love uh, uh, interacting and uh, grilling students about their work. Uh, so um, today I would like to talk about some issues that I regard as important for uh, the future uh, of the world. Um, so, so, so this is a picture of uh, GDP per capita. So, so that's, that's uh, our usual measure of total economic activity. Uh, it's a sum of, so real, so GDP is a sum of uh, consumption expenditures, investments expenditures, uh, the amount of public expenditures and so on, the total of uh, gross domestic product. Uh, but it, for me, it's important to think in terms of per capita, how much per person, because that's, to me, that's m much more informative than just the total of real GDP. So here, here's a picture that goes back to 1950 uh, until more or less the present. Uh, and uh, some countries, uh, so, so it goes on the scale from zero to 60,000 US dollars, purchasing power parity adjusted uh, US dollars. Uh, now, here's uh, another picture, also uh, GDP per capita. And this is uh, another set of countries. 
And as you can see, not all countries have done uh, equally well. There are some spectacular success stories. The yellow curve is Hong Kong. The blue curve, light blue curve it, uh, represents Korea, which was a uh, driving force in, uh, in Asia. Uh, the, um, I, I suppose for the purpose of today's talk, the, uh, uh, where uh, we, we focus somewhat, we have focused somewhat uh, on uh, Japan. Uh, Japan uh, did very well for, for, uh, for a while until about uh, the early to mid 19, uh, actually a little after the 1990s but then they have uh, slowed down dramatically. Uh, towards the bottom of the picture is, is a collection of uh, eh, mostly s South American countries. These are, these are, uh, these are um, Argentina, Chile, Mexico. Let's see. So, uh, one thing I would like to talk about is uh, about the inequality across nations. So, the French economist Piketty, uh, at some point, uh, pointed out, uh, and he talked about the extent of inequality within a nation. Uh, now, m my, my uh, contention is, if you look across the world, the extent of inequality is orders of magnitude greater than anything Piketty talked about. Uh, and this, this is a good illustration, because this, uh, this is uh, this represents the extent of real GDP per capita in a number of uh, in a number of countries, mostly sub in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the brown curve is the success story of the of the uh, of Africa. They, that's the curve for Botswana. Botswana. Uh, they were lucky enough to, uh, to have found uh, lots of minerals, diamonds, and so on. And, and Botswana has done a great job in uh, managing the, the, uh, their uh, wealth. Uh, the rest of the picture, probably my saddest uh, picture, I can imagine. So this, this, this uh, you can read for the, yourselves the uh, Am I blocking the view? <laughs> Maybe I should walk back and forth a little so you can make sure you can you can see it. Uh, so 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 the, these these pictures go these uh, countries their GDP per capita uh, run mostly between little uh, over zero to let's say about 2,000. Uh, as I said, a, a very sad story. Oh, so, now I would, I would like to talk some about what is it really that makes nations grow? This is my key picture. So uh, you may be thrown off a little bit by the fact that you know it, it's a it's a mathematical mathematical function. I uh, uh, I think mathematics is extremely uh, useful. I encourage all students to learn as much mathematics as they can, which which will. Uh, be, which will further their uh, their progress in the in the future. Uh, now this this is a key function that kind of describes how nations 
go. It says that gross domestic product at time t, as I said, uh, gross domestic product is the sum of consumption plus investment expenditures plus uh, public uh, expenditures. Uh, what, what's, and uh, it says that it's the function of the of z, z times a function of, of something else. So z is the technology level. And to me, technology level is the key uh, factor that makes uh, uh, countries grow. Uh, on the right hand side is also a, a function of capital and labor. Uh, cap, uh, capital, the capital stock is the, is the uh, sum of the of factories, uh, machines, office buildings. Uh, in the nation, the L labor import is is uh, that's mostly um, that that's something that may vary somewhat depending on the skill level of various workers and and, and, and so on. Uh, to what extent are the workers high skilled or low low skilled workers, but also. Uh, Edu the education level uh, may be a big factor in uh, in making the L grow. So, so th this is my key uh, description of how economies grow, and, and, and was particularly powerful as I, as I mentioned the Z, the Z, uh, because it, measurements suggest that this whole function is a linear in Z, and uh, that, that means it's extremely powerful to make economies grow. Uh, now, I would like to uh, sh show uh, the GDP per capita for a number of countries, uh, and, and these are mostly countries in uh, uh, in various places in, in Europe, there's the United Kingdom, France, Spain, Greece, and, uh, Germany, uh, Austria, Berlin, Italy, and Ireland. So, so, so they, um, you can see they, they grow uh, uh, not spectacularly, with one exception, the green curve. The green curve uh, is uh, GDP per capita for Ireland, uh, and Ireland was um, Ireland to me is an especially interesting case because they they decided to make economic policy certain. To, to they they decided. Uh, I mean, they they hadn't do, been doing so well until about 1990. But then they decided to make economic policy certain for the next 15 years. It, they said that if you, whether you're a foreign or domestic company, if you set up, set up shop in Ireland, these will be your tax rates, not just uh, next year, but also in the 93, 94, 95, all the way to 2005, 2005. Uh, and that had, a, as you can see in the picture, it had a spectacular effect on uh, on, the, on the Irish economy, removing uncertainty about economic policy. Uh, the the uh, other countries are, uh, you know, they're uh, moving along as well, but uh, uh, but but certainly well below. The levels of uh, of of uh, Ireland, you can see that in many of these countries hover between thirty or forty thousand uh, dollars per capita. Oh, so now I would like to uh, eventually I'm going to talk a uh, focus quite a bit of Spain for reasons that will become clear to you. But 
but uh, uh, I would like to introduce Spain. Uh, and in this picture, uh, in this picture, you can see that. Uh, well, first of all, let me explain the uh, broken line. Uh, how easy is it to see? It's. <laughs> The broken line is in gray, and, and maybe evidently, well, I can barely see it uh, <laughs> on the uh, on the screen. Uh, so I suppose it's a point of work. I could I could explain to you that it goes like this, uh, and that represents the. Uh, how well Spain had done from 1960 to 1990. And then uh, that line I tried to explain to you is extended to the present, uh, extended to 2020, basically. Uh, now, what's, what's uh, dramatic about this picture is that by 1990, Spain came to a full halt. Growth came to a full halt. It stopped completely. And uh, uh, let's see. Well, I'm supposed not never to go back in, in this picture. So, uh, so let me. This will be fine. Uh, so he here you see a number of countries: United King, Kingdom, France, Spain. Uh, and so on. Let me uh, move now to uh, to my main focus today, for reasons that will become clear to you. Uh, my main focus is going to be Spain. Uh, now, uh, for now, just look at this picture and and, and see that after 1990, uh, the, uh, the growth in Spain came to a full stop. Uh, I did some work with a, uh, an economist uh, that I, I did work with at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And uh, we, we, uh, we discovered that when it was announced that uh, that Spain was going to join the uh, eurozone, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, um, what should I call it the uh, the uh, uh, there's a term we use the oh the country risk premium in Spain's interest rates, the country risk premium. So, so when it was announced that we're going to join the Eurozone, the uh, country risk premium declined dramatically. And that had a uh, very interesting effect. Um, so I guess I have to point it this way. Uh, so that, that had an interesting effect. And uh, these, these pictures are now in, uh, in terms of GDP per hour work. Uh, more or less uh, uh, confirming that Spain did not do very well. Uh, if you can see, I can see the uh, extension of the gray, the gray line, the average, until 1990. But I don't, it looks like you will have to have sharp eyes to, to see that, that extension. Uh, now, uh, this is, a, to me, is the most interesting picture in uh, today's talk. And this is the nominal value added, uh, the value added shares by sectors. 
two sectors, two sectors in, in Spain. Uh, the, I call them the non-tradable goods sector and the tradable goods sectors. Uh, now, if, if you go back to 1980, these two sectors were about 50% 50, 50 each. By uh, around 2008, the uh, non-tradable goods sector had grown to about two-thirds of the total, and the tradable goods sector to one-third. It turns out that was very bad. Uh, now, now, just to give you ex uh, an idea of what's included in what I call tradable goods and non-tradable goods. So tradable goods, I have a list of uh, five of them, agriculture, fishing, mining, total manufacturing, and publishing. Non-tradable construction, general repairs, accommodations, food service activities. Actually, uh, for fun, I included haircuts. So, uh, it, you may not believe it, but even I need a haircut uh, occasionally. Uh, so now, why, why is that important? Uh, in the um, in the, uh, so the blue curve, that's output per hour work in the tradable goods sector. Uh, the, this came from work I did with an Enrique Garcia Maca in, uh, in, uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. And so we, for various reasons that you don't need to worry about, is we had for our own purpose, we included two other curves, the red one and the green one. But you should ignore those two curves. For the purpose of today's talk, only the blue curve uh, is important. And as you can see, to, just to uh, fix your mind uh, on, a, let's say, an index, Let, let's say that in 1980, we say that output per hour work is represented by the index of 100. Um, let's see. So right about here, about 100. By 2008, more or less, it had grown to about 220. So just about up here. To about 220, so more than double. From 100 to more than double. Uh, now, if you look at um, the non tradable goods sector, again, if we do the same exercise, we uh, fix our minds on a point that, let's say, Right here, uh, for 1980 again, and we compare that with what happened in uh, in 2008. Only only a 20 percent or so increase. Much less, much less. So so about a 20 percent increase as it compared with the doubling, as you saw in the, other, in the tradable goods sector. So, so why, is, why is that important? Uh, well, the, uh, the tradable goods sector is characterized by a lot of competition. It turns out competition is very important for uh, the growth of nations. Uh, so let me conclude 
with uh, given that Uwe Moritz is here, I'll, uh, I'll conclude with uh, uh, a conclusion along the lines of what does peace have to do with have to do with it? What's peace got to do with it? So peace uh, in nations uh, reduces uncertainty. Peace promotes trade. Uh, peace allows technological change uh, along the lines of the Z in my production function. Trade increases uh, growth uh, along the lines that you saw in the comparison of, uh, of uh, uh, it, uh, that you saw in, in the, in the com comparison of the tradable versus non-tradable tradable goods. Uh, you, may, you may ask, uh, why, uh, what's, what's so special about uh, the tradable goods? I don't know, I forget if I uh, already gave you the answer to that, but the key answer is tradable goods uh, are, uh, are the, uh, competition is extremely important for, uh, for efficient uh, output of goods and services. Uh, now, the bottom line is growth elevates the welfare of citizens. Uh, that was probably especially startling in the, in the case of, uh, uh, of my picture for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the uh, welfare is what we, what we really care about. Uh, that's the purpose, and and that's part of what makes the uh, makes the uh, picture for Sub-Saharan Africa so uh, depressing. Uh, at some point, we had a conference. I'm uh, I'm at the uh, I'm. Uh, professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, we had a conference uh, uh, in which someone talked about uh, trade and uh, et cetera. And I remember asking the presenter, do you think it would be feasible to export technological change which we all know is, is, is very important, the Z in my production function, export uh, trade, for example, to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, well, he was a, the speaker was a little ambivalent about that. But my contention would be, if there were a way to, uh, export technology from us, let's say, to Sub-Saharan Africa, that could be spectacularly important for those nations. Certainly contribute to, to peace in those nations and certainly make the welfare of the citizens elevated. So, Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I forget, was I supposed to take questions? Yes. Uh, oh, next step. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, then uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Chitman.
Uh, our next section is Q and A. Okay, so we have we have a few questions for you. Okay, so the first first question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm the Dr. Julie Gerati. I'm a vice president of planning and social service. Actually, I led you there in USA about a half years ago. The that great honor that I is that is named the Nobel Prize teaching. Yes, I'm so proud indeed in our uh, very uh, distinctive place too. My question, uh, just very curious that if. Uh, By the way, that uh, if you were the U.S. president, and if, if I were what? If you were the new U.S. president, the new U.S. US president, president, U.S. president, ex president, <laughs> United States president. Oh, United States president. Sorry. Uh, what would you be uh, policy uh, regarding uh, international peace? And it can be good. Thank you, sir. It is not hard to So um, I'm not sure I, I got the gist of the question, but uh, to me, the uh, economic growth is extremely valuable to to the nation's citizens. And uh, that's why I try to emphasize it so much in my pictures. Some countries where the growth wasn't uh, not it wasn't particularly impressive, which is, uh, in fact, in one case I I characterized the picture as my most depressing picture uh, because I I realized that for those citizens in those nations, that collection of nations. Uh, the, the welfare is much reduced, and that's why I asked the question of in in, a, in one of our conferences, uh, would it be feasible to um, to uh, export technology, for example, to those nations in that picture? Uh, I was hoping that the uh, the speaker would confirm that that would be possible, but right now I'm kind of uh, uncertain because uh, he was not able to uh, give a firm answer to that question, and I think that is probably for the for the reason of, of that disparity in. Uh, in equality or, or the extent of inequality a, a, across nations, uh, you know, that's to me that would be uh, one of the most important things that uh, one could come up with. So, so Piketty, uh, getting back to Piketty just for a moment. Uh, Piketty is famous. He's a French economist, and he he he, um, he he made the extent of inequality. He studied this extent of inequality within his country, France, and, and that's why uh, when uh, whenever I talk about Piketty, for example. My my uh, comment would always be, if you look across, that's why I always emphasize, if you look across nations, the extent of inequality in the rest of the world is orders of magnitude greater than anything Piketty uh, came up with. So to to try to. Uh, Make the welfare of nations improve to, to serve the problems of those nations. Uh, that's why I think that's one of the ultimate goals that one can uh, engage in. Uh, 
and uh, I suppose that's my I suppose that's my conclusion. Did did I have any other slides? Oh, oh, here. Let me just double check. I'm done. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, there we go. Here we go. The last slide. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I forgot about the uh, uh, my important piece uh, slide and the conclusion about what does uh, peace have to do with it. So peace. Uh, uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, peace uh, reduces uh, uncertainty. Peace promotes trade. Uh, I think your uh, the picture about the tradable versus non-tradable goods was very is very impressive. Peace allows technological change. Peace uh, makes it easier to take advantage of the Z in my production function. Uh, Peace, uh, well, trade increases growth. Uh, as was the case in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, I think we had this already. Oh. And we wanted to have the next question. Oh. One moment. OK. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm the Hadoop Supernat, the head of the Faculty of Economics. My question is about the artificial intelligence or AI. Today, the AI can replace the human workforce, right? But if it, it can uh, increase the productivity and GDP growth, however, it leads to higher unemployment. In your opinion, how the policymaker balance between economic goals and human well-being is my question. Thank you. Well, the, the, uh, my overall uh, answer is that economic growth is crucial to uh, the welfare uh, of nations. So, but, but I admit that I don't know much about AI in particular. Uh, the uh, I suppose you're suggesting that um, maybe robots could be could replace the humans in uh, uh, in the pr production. Uh, I, for a while, I, I lived in in the town of Bergen in, in Norway, and, and there, there was a company there that was famous for uh, using robots in their production. Uh, they, they became famous uh, uh, not just in, uh, in their local area, but in Norway as a whole. Uh, so now uh, I suppose the, the uh, gist of my answer is going to be, well, uh, it, it, if that can be done so that the welfare is Maintain, uh, then uh, that's that would be a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I'm the press with that. I'm right here. Oh, I can't sit there. there. Okay. And and the one who talked about your guitar. By the time I went to your office uh, two years ago, uh, my question is that. Could you discuss recent developments or tips in U.S. economic policy and their potential impact on trade dynamics or peace efforts with Thailand and other nations in Southeast Asia? So, we, Tanya and I have not spent much time in Thailand, so uh, I admit that it's a little difficult to, to speak directly to uh, the role for Thailand in particular. Um, we uh, 
So far, we, we have been very impressed with being in, uh, in Thailand. And, uh, and, and we, uh, we love everything we've seen. But, uh, but your question is sufficiently uh, specific that it, it's a bit outside my general area of expertise. And so uh, I, I'd be reluctant to uh, be, be too, uh, uh, I, I just, I, I, I think I would need to study uh, Thailand uh, more specifically, look at uh, data, and, and, and then, uh, then uh, my guess is that I, I would be able to come up, I generally know what kind of data to look for, <laughs> that, that's kind of uh, what I typically do, and, and so uh, I, I think if you if you give me time to uh, to look at the data, I I will be able to come up, come up with an answer to you. Okay, so please come back next time. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our Q and A session. Okay, and uh, I would ask Professor Kidman to stay on the stage because next session is going to be uh, presenting token of appreciation. May I? ask uh, Vice President Chernobyl to uh, give a token of appreciation to Professor Kidland. And today we have a representative from the Embassy of Norway, a Deputy Head of Nation, Ms. Tara Ottman. I would like you to uh, be on stage and receive a token of appreciation, please. And please stay on the stage and I will have a picture. I'm talking about appreciation too. Concludes our programs today. You know, my last role is to thank you and 
We'll see you next time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us, everybody. เดี๋ยวที่สุดครับผมอยากจะถ่ายรูปกับอาจารย์นะครับ